Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I am very excited to bring David Crew back to um, Ashland virtually with um, the Tewksbury Public Library. So if you're here from Tewksbury, hooray. If you're here from Ashland, hooray. And let us know where you're coming from if you're not, or even if you are. So in the chat, I mean, um, I would like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming. And um, as I said, we had David here a few months ago talking about uh, the building of Route 128. And it was just so, so fascinating that we had to have him back. So um, again, let us know where you're from. There is going to be a, an interactive um, part of this discussion in which you can put comments into the chat or the Q&A, and I will um, moderate them to David. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to say a whole lot, except that David had this amazing talk about the big dig with us for a few months ago. And as you know, and he has several books out today, he's talking about the story of uh, this escape from Alcatraz, which is a true story, but he wrote a fictionalized book about it. Is that correct, David? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, it's um, fiction, but based on true events. He also has many other books that are fascinating and interesting, and I hope to have him back again. I do have him back again later in the year to talk about those. So I'll talk about that later. David, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here, and I can't wait to hear this talk. Well, thank you very much, Mina, and uh, thank you again uh, to uh, the folks in Ashland for uh, having me back. Um, yeah, uh, today what I'm going to do is to tell you the real honest to goodness story behind my recently published novel, which is titled Inseparable. We're going to talk today, and, and one of the reasons I love this story and why I chose it to launch the idea of this novel, because I love stories that make you go, if this weren't true, you wouldn't believe it. And this story is filled with those moments where you just go, really? That really happened? Yes, it did. So we're going to start by talking about the escape by three men, Frank Morris and the brothers John and Clarence Anglin who escaped from Alcatraz prison in the middle of San Francisco Bay on the night of June 11th, 1962. When, uh, when my talk on the real part of the story is concluded, we're going to hear from you. I'd love to hear some of your theories, find out your questions. And then afterwards, I will talk about the novel, which was published last year by DX Varos. So worldwide, we're fascinated by prisons. In Paris, people flock to the site of the Bastille. In Dublin, there's a waiting list for tickets to the infamous Gaul. And where do you suppose the number one paid tourist attraction in San Francisco Bay Area is? Of course, it's Alcatraz. This former military prison from the Civil War would in 1933 be declared by the federal government to be a great site for a federal penitentiary. The country in the midst of a depression and still dealing with the effects of the ill-advised prohibition saw an epic rise in violent crime and decided that this lonely island in the middle of San Francisco Bay would be a great place to put hardened criminals. Now, there were a lot of people in the Bay Area who were not happy. They disputed the government's contention that the prison was, due to its location in the middle of this bay, escape proof. In fact, to prove their point, some residents cooked up this publicity stunt. swam the mile and three quarters from Alcatraz Island to San Francisco in under an hour. And by the way, she and the rest of the members of her swim team turned around and swam back to the island. Now, defenders of the prison scoffed at this demonstration, saying that she, as well as her, her friends, were all members of an elite swimming team. And they were trained athletes 
But the fact is, they prove that it could be done. But the federal government was not deterred and work on converting the island into a federal prison proceeded. Now, the place was in pretty tough shape after 70 years of use by the army. Among the many security measures were gun turrets placed around the island, realigned corridors to prevent prisoner access, 269 cells all got new steel bars while fencing was installed around the building which would house the inmates. The guards would live on the island with their families. A two-lane bowling alley was built for their recreation. This is where the government sent some of the country. Capone, Whitey Bulger, Bumpy Johnson, Robert Stroud, and Alvin Karpis, plus dozens of other prisoners who kept escaping from other federal and state prisons. all the escape artists and put them into one place. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? How about almost three dozen escapes, many of which ended in the death of the escapees? The most famous escape is the one to which we still do not know the result, one which clearly has captured our imagination. It sure from Alcatraz, that of this 1962 escape by three inmates. So let's meet them, shall we? We'll start with Frank Morris. He had the good fortune to be portrayed by Clint Eastwood in that 1979 movie. Morris, well, in 1937, when he was just 11 years old, his parents abandoned him at a Washington, D.C. church. He then spent time in an orphanage and was placed in foster care, but was never adopted. As a teenager, Frank started committing petty crimes and soon graduated to auto theft and armed robbery. After his capture and conviction for bank robbery, he was sentenced to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Now Frank escapes and he manages to keep from getting caught for almost a whole year. After he was caught, and we can assume they were pretty pissed off, they sent him to Alcatraz, where he was in 1960. This is Alan West, and he was a car thief from New York City. He had the misfortune to be considered so unimportant to the plot of that Clint Eastwood movie that the director, Don Siegel, didn't even use his real name in the picture. Siegel called the character Charlie Butts. I don't know if he was trying to say something here. Anyway, the real Alan West had been sent to Alcatraz in 1957 after several attempted escapes from prison. By 1961, Frank Morris and Alan West were joined in Alcatraz by two brothers, John and Clarence Anglin. Now, what makes their partnership with Frank Morris so interesting to me is that while Frank grew up with almost without any family, the Anglin brothers had an abundance of family. They were among 13 children of George and Rachel Anglin, itinerant farm workers who followed the harvest in America between Florida and Michigan during the 1920s and the difficult 1930s. Just before the Second World War, they settled in Ruskin, Florida, where they raised and harvested tomatoes. But I guess Ruskin is famous for their tomatoes. Unfortunately, the stability of a permanent home was not enough for John and Clarence, who, along with their brother Alfred, began committing petty crimes around Ruskin. They graduated to gas station stick-ups and eventually to a bank robbery. Caught and convicted, 
John and Clarence were sentenced to the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. After several escapes in which both were in Alcatraz, were sent to Alcatraz by early 1961. And that's where they met Frank Morris and Alan West. Now, an irony of Alcatraz was that it was chosen as a maximum security prison because, as you can see, it sat in the middle of chilly San Francisco Bay. But being in the middle of San Francisco Bay meant it was surrounded by salt water and salty air. And salt is corrosive. So by 1961, Alcatraz was literally falling apart. And this was the weakness exploited by Morris, West, and the Anglins. Four men who had spent countless hours figuring out ways to escape from different prisons all over the country. It somehow seems inevitable that they would gravitate towards each other and combine their experience and skills and solve all the challenges confronting them. The biggest one being the bay itself. Look, water doesn't have to be ice cold to kill you like it did Leonardo DiCaprio's character in the Titanic. By the way, there was plenty of room on that door for him, but we move on. It takes only water under 70 degrees to cause hypothermia. And the temperature of the water in the San Francisco Bay is usually in the 50s in June. And at those temperatures, it only takes about an hour or two to lose consciousness. And death follows in about six hours. Up until 1961, any escapees who made it into the water, who weren't captured or shot, had drowned. Oh, and here's an interesting side note. To keep the prisoners from building up a resistance to cold, the water in the prisoners' showers were kept at a very high temperature, and there were no spigots. The water temperature could not be adjusted. So, how do you cross a cold San Francisco Bay without getting into it? Well, according to the FBI, the answer was in an article in the November 1960 issue of Popular Mechanics, which described how a hunter used pieces of rubber to make goose decoys. To make the decoys waterproof, he used rubber cement, the kind you can buy in any stationery or drugstore. Turns out the chemical compound in rubber cement will fuse pieces of rubber together in a process called vulcanization. Now, issues of popular mechanics were available to inmates in the prison library and rubber cement was among the art supplies made available to the inmates. We know that Frank Morris read the magazine because after the escape, they found an issue with another article similar to the first one on how to make waterproof life vests using vulcanization. That's a pretty strong argument. This is where he got the idea to make the raft. But Most investigators believe it was Frank who noticed on the other side of a metal vent at the back of every cell was a service corridor. Frank, exploiting the decaying condition of the prison to his advantage, chipped away at the concrete around the vent until he could remove it. Then he squeezed into the corridor and began exploring. He shimmied up a water pipe and he It was the perfect spot for a workshop. Now, working hours would have to be between lights out, which at Alcatraz was 9.30, and wake up call, which was at seven the next morning. In between, guards patrolled the blocks of cells and they would look in on the sleeping prisoners. They rarely rousted them. And in fact, with expenses at the prison rising, there were fewer guards on duty, so the chances of a surprise count was very low. But still, guards are going to notice if a man is not in his cot. So now another irony. 
pointed out to me by a U.S. Marshal who had worked on this case. Alcatraz had been one of the strictest penitentiaries in the country, but by the late 1950s, embraced the concept of prison reform. Inmates were given access to paints, brushes, and canvas. Frank Morris, Alan West, and the Anglin brothers used those supplies to make these paper mache fake heads, which they painted using the art supplies. Thank you, Warden. They glued hair from the prison barbershop on top of the fake heads, and they placed them on their pillows. Then they'd stuff blankets under one another, under the main blanket to look like a body. So passing guards would assume the prisoners were asleep, when in fact, they were busy in the workshop they had set up just above their cell block. Again, you can't make this stuff up. They also used the paper mache paste to patch and paint the chipped concrete around the vents to hide their work during the day. Okay, so now they have a workshop where they can build their raft. The arts program provides all the rubber cement they would need. What they needed next were to collect as many raincoats as possible. And here's another bit of luck for the escapees. Prisoners were used as laborers outside the prison walls and so were issued rubber raincoats for days when the weather was poor. And anyone who's been to San Francisco knows that's a lot. The other inmates were more than happy to help because there's nothing cons like more than sticking it to the warden and the guards. So they would wear their raincoats here into the exercise yard and then drop them onto the ground where they would be picked up by one of the escapees. By early 1962, they were spending nights in the workshop constructing the raft. So now I'm sure you're asking the same question as the investigators did. How did they... the beach? And that was another very clever part of their plan. They would inflate the raft after they got it down to the beach. By using a concertina, also known as a squeeze box, modified with a hose connected from the bellows to the corner of the raft. Moving the bell And just as we saw at the end of the Clint Eastwood movie, the raft and drifted off into San Francisco Bay. Wait, wait a minute. Three men? Didn't I say all along there were four men building the raft? There were, but Alan West, or as he would be known in the movie, Charlie Butts, turned out to be a better Mason than he should have been because the paste the vent hardened like concrete and he couldn't loosen the vent from the hole accessing the corridor the night of the escape. He was stuck inside his cell as Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin twelfth, 1962. Started out as a typical day on the rock. In some ways, Alcatraz was no different than hundreds of other prisons in that inmates would follow a strict routine. Prisoners were to get up, wash, make their beds, and then stand at attention at their cell doors. On the morning of June 12th, 1962, the guard assigned to B Block began his walk down this corridor. Cell 138, he saw that Frank Morris was still in his cot, sleeping soundly. He entered. And he yelled at Morris, get up. And Frank doesn't move. Now, disobedience is the surest way to get in trouble, not just at the Rock, but at any prison. So the guard took out his baton and poked at Frank's body. That's when Frank's head 
rolled onto the floor. It took the guard a second to process what he was seeing, a dismembered head, but no blood, before he blew his whistle to summon for help. Within minutes, two more whistles echoed down B block as the guards discovered fake heads in both the Anglin brothers' cells. Final count, three prisoners were gone. Now, during their search, the guards also found a morose and disconsolate Alan West in his cell with his fake head and partially displaced vent cover. Wasn't too hard to figure out what had happened. To help in their search for the escapees, the authorities offer Alan West a deal. You tell us everything you know about the escape, how they do it, but more importantly, where are they going? Do that and we won't charge you with attempted escape, which if we do, will extend your sentence big time. So Wes quickly agrees and he sings like a bird, spilling everything he knows, including their intended destination, which he said was Angel Island, located just north of Alcatraz. Now, as my U.S. Marshal friend said, reminded me, this was testimony from a lifelong criminal, so perhaps we take it at face value. But now what we come to is the part of the story that really makes me laugh. Because according to the FBI files, that Frank Morris and his 130 IQ were the brains behind the scheme. And according to the Alcatraz website, Alan West took offense to that. He claimed it was he, not Frank Morris, who solved many of the problems faced during the months leading up to the escape. Things like modifying the guts of a vacuum cleaner to be used as a motorized screwdriver for when it was time to remove the cover of the duct which led them to the prison roof or how to collect the raincoats from the other cons. I mean, you know, a man has his pride. Well, now we come to the biggest question of them all. What happened to Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin? Nobody, except perhaps the three men, knows for sure. We don't have many clues, and beyond a few basic in. We start with fact number one. No bodies or remnants of men that could be tied to the three escapees were ever recovered. Fact number two. Two days after the escape, searchers found a makeshift paddle and a waterproof package of photos belonging to the Anglins floating off the southern end of Angel Island. Three. Nine days after the escape, shreds of rubber consistent with pieces of the raft were found near the Golden Gate Bridge. Finally, the next day, June 22nd, one of the makeshift life preservers was found floating just 50 yards off of Alcatraz. Now, on July 17th, five weeks after the escape, a body was seen floating about 20 miles northwest of the Golden Gate Bridge by the crew of this Norwegian freighter. It was clothed in full-length denim trousers. So, folks, that's it. These are about the un only undisputed events after the escape on which everybody seems to be able to agree. Good luck getting consensus, especially with the Internet these days getting consensus on anything else. Like the body seen by this freighter is a great example. They saw a body. Could it have been one of the escapees? Well, coroners from jurisdictions around the Bay said the condition of the body as described by the freighter's crew was consistent with what they would have expected for a body floating in salt water for five weeks. But the coroner for San Francisco disagreed. He even proposed another candidate, a man who had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge just five days earlier. So much is conjecture. Could the men have made it to Angel Island or somewhere else around the bay? 
No expert will say it's impossible, but most say it's highly unlikely. Now, if you're a fan, as I am, of the Mythbusters TV show, you might remember they did a whole episode on the escape. And it's a terrific episode. It's posted on uh, YouTube. Watch the episode. They do prove that a crossing with the homemade raft, exactly as constructed by the Anglins, Alan West, and Frank Morris, is possible. Then we have the case of inmate John Paul Scott. Six months after Frank Morris and the Anglins escaped on their raft, Scott somehow got off the island. And with the help of water wings that he had made from a pair of rubber gloves, made it all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge. That's a distance of over two and a half miles in cold water. Now, he couldn't do much once he reached land as he had developed hypothermia and was so exhausted, he couldn't crawl, let alone run, when he was spotted by a group of teenagers and he was easily captured. that the men did make it. So if they did, where did they go? Why aren't there any reports of thefts of food, clothing, or a car? Clearly they would have wanted to get as far away from the prison as soon as possible. For many investigators, those indicate the men didn't even survive their trip because if they did, there would have been a rash of thefts. In fact, the US Marshal I spoke with was very clear on this point. He said criminals rarely change. And the only really, they only really know one way to approach things, and that's by breaking the law. He said it's extremely unlikely, in his opinion, that Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin would not have engaged in the same criminal activity which got them locked up. But again, even he says unlikely. He will not say impossible. Now, there have been claims over the years by people who said they were or claiming to represent one of the escapees. The FBI followed up on all of them, determining none were real. The mother of the Anglin brothers supposedly received flowers anonymously, anonymously every Mother's Day until her death in 1973. After her death, another funny bit, a newspaper in Alabama reported that two very tall, unusual looking women in heavy makeup attended her funeral. But the US Marshals were of course watching the funeral, which cast doubt on this report. They surely would have noticed or questioned the quote, unusual women. But again, it's a great story. Well, now we come to this tantalizing photograph. You might have seen the photo which shows two middle-aged men standing on either side of a large termite mound. No one disputes the photo was taken in the mid-1970s or because of that termite mound that it was taken in Brazil. It was sent to the Anglin family by a boyhood friend of the brothers, a fellow named Fred Brizzy. Brizzy contended the men in the photo were John and Clarence Anglin. He claimed the brothers survived their trip across the bay and wound up in Brazil, where they went straight and owned a farm. Although one U.S. Marshal assigned to the case called it, quote, the best actionable lead we have, unquote, he also said it could be a misdirection, something to throw investigators off the trail. Another Marshal was quick to say, of his story. But this photo, it's, it's hard to dismiss. The big question, of course, is whether the two men in the photo really are or could be John and Clarence Anglin. Ken and David Widmer are nephews of John and Clarence, and over the years, they have been working with investigators and documentary producers to uncover the fate of their uncles. In a 2018 History Channel documentary, the photo of the men was analyzed using facial recognition software to compare the brothers' mugshots 
with that of the men in the Brazil photo. The analyst who worked on the photo said he believed they were a match. And two years later, using even better AI technology, a totally different company and a different analyst reported they believed there was a high probability of a match between the men and the men in the photo and the Anglins. So that, folks, is what we know and what we think we know. Uh, I, Mina is going to read some of your questions and some of your comments, and we're going to uh, talk a bit more about the escape itself. And then afterwards, we will talk about this, the novel that I based on this escape. So, Mina? Thank you, David. That was really fascinating. Um, so uh, for everybody who's here, feel free to write into the chat or into the Q&A any thoughts you have on what you think might have happened. And then we'll see if David actually wrote about it in his book, Inseparable. This is actually the only comment so far, which I think is a hoot. Stephen says, I wonder if one of these men is listening to your talk right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, yeah, they, well, they do get the internet in Brazil, so... Uh... <laughs> That's a great thought. I love that. That's terrific. So hi, John. <laughs> hi, Clarence. <laughs> oh, they don't go by those names. They're not dumb. Um, uh, oh, wait. Juan Karen and Carranzo, perhaps, or something. Oh, did they tell the prisoners that there were sharks in the bay? Cindy asks. Um, in the bay, they're, they're, I don't know if they're a common occurrence um but uh, again uh sharks are pretty ravenous but there were no pieces of bodies that floated up on any shore so it's uh, highly unlikely that um that was their fate oh i just i, I wonder if she's asking if that was a deterrent that they used to tell well, it didn't stop these three guys or these <laughs> you know the four guys from even trying and it didn't True. stop a lot of others either no <laughs> David says, was the Clint Eastwood film accurate except the West character? Great question. Uh, when you get as deep into that, down this rabbit hole as, as I have been, you, you see, you can pick some nits. There, there are two that I'll mention. One is, first of all, Patrick McGowan is a terrific actor. I mean, if you've ever seen the series, The Prisoner, he's fantastic. However, he was nothing like uh, Otis, um, uh, the, the warden uh, of, at, uh, at Alcatraz in 1962, who was one of those reform-minded, um, trying to give the prisoners something to do and some trades for the, when they got out of prison. He was nothing like the uh, uh, vicious and... Uh, uh, character that McGowan played. The other thing, which is is the real nit to pick, there's a great scene when Frank Morris, Clint Eastwood, first comes to the prison, and McGowan gives him this speech about you know nobody escapes alive from the rock, and you you know you gotta pay attention to the rules. McGowan is playing with the nail clippers which he leaves in an ashtray on his desk. And we see Clint Eastwood slipping the nail clippers into his pocket, which when he gets to his cell, he uses to start scraping away at the concrete. In real life, at the prison, all the prisoners were assigned their own nail clippers. So Eastwood's character, Mars, would not have had to steal those clippers. Uh, but still, we believe it was the clippers that he first used, Morris used to start scraping away the concrete and start to figure out his plan. But other than that, that's, it's a really, it's a really good telling. And of course they shot the movie, some of those scenes on the rock itself, which really lends accuracy to the whole picture. It's a great film. So um, a couple of people have asked this sort of similar question, Judy and Julie. Um, is there any DNA of these guys in storage somewhere and would modern methods have possibly found the guys? And Judy mm -hmm. says, did they autopsy the corpse they found? I know there was no DNA testing at that time, but maybe there mm -hmm. were identifying marks on it. 
So here's the thing about that body that was seen floating on July 17th. It was not until that Norwegian freighter returned from its run in October that they finally radioed the Coast Guard with their findings. Hmm. And by that time, the body was floating somewhere out in the Pacific. And so there was no opportunity to do that. Interesting question about the DNA. Um, I don't know. Um, it's funny because I'm working on a, uh, another book now, which is in it's a real story, which involves DNA analysis. It's if there were perhaps the envelopes of the letters that the Anglin supposedly sent to their mother, where they licked the envelopes, perhaps in a CSI type of uh, situation, they might be able to extract the DNA. But then wh who are you going to compare it to? You got to find those two guys down in Brazil or wherever. So I, I don't know. I mean, um, my, my understanding is that DNA analysis has not been done on anything that they might have used up until 1962 when they escaped. Um, speaking of Brazil, Huck says, it seems unlikely to me that the brothers would be able to get the money to buy a farm in Brazil. What do you think? I agree. It, mm -hmm. it does sound very far-fetched. But if you are friends with a guy like Brizzy, a drug dealer uh, and a crook, maybe that's where the money comes from. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm pulling that one out of thin air. <laughs> But well, you're right. It, it, I mean, it, it takes money to uh, make people look the other way, especially when you don't have a passport or trying to get a passport counterfeited. I mean, all of that takes money. And I don't think it's very likely that the men had that money. Mm -hmm. um, how many months did they work on this raft before escaping? It's hard to believe no guard saw or heard anything during this time. Again, um, uh, Alcatraz was falling apart. There were calls for its closure anyway, and they were starting to reduce the number of inmates in the prison so they could reduce the number of guards and start to save money. And uh, it, it sounds unlikely, but that part is really true. Mm -hmm. They worked up in that, in that uh, and by the way, there's not a whole lot of banging hammering needed you're using glue and you're cutting pieces of rubber and stitch and and gluing it together so it's it's completely possible and likely that they were never heard so on that same topic judy says might they have had help from the prison guards looking the other way how could prison employees not notice an unexplained massive usage of rubber cement and the empty jars or a raft moving out of the building well first of all uh, we're back to the money question. So, um, you know, as uh, as the Romans used to say, "Qui bono?" Who benefits? If the guard is going to do it, he's going to need some serious bribing. Where's that money coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and as far as you know, who's <laughs> there's fewer guards, fewer prisoners, and they're dealing with a prison that's literally falling apart around them. Who has the time to be? Okay, let's see. How many jars of uh, glue do we have? It, mm. it, it's, it's the sort of thing that just sort of falls under the radar. It just, you just, okay, well, you know, mm -hmm. I thought I had 12 bottles. I only have 10. And then a new shipment comes in. And so it's the sort of thing that can easily uh, f fall under the radar. I love opinion. this comment from Cindy that they were ingenious men. If only they had used that intelligence and resourcefulness for good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't we say that about, I mean, you know, that's so many other criminals. Mm -hmm. you know. um, Laura says, when was Alcatraz closed for prisoners or asks? It was, pr it was closed the following year. Mm. And I, I love that. See, um, the, the name of the last prisoner as they're loading the launch and they're taking the prisoners and going to send them to other uh, prisons. He was a... Um, he was a, a thief and a burglar. Oh, gosh, I, I'd have to look his name up. But he, um, hold on. I actually used his name in the book. And uh, here we go. It was March 21st, 1963. Frank Weatherman. 
who mm. was the criminal. He was the last prisoner. And as I wrote, the prisoner turned to the reporter and spoke the last words on the island by a convict. Quote, Alcatraz was never no good for nobody. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let me see. Allison asks, why didn't the Norwegian ship contact Coast Guard right away? Isn't that protocol? I, nobody knows. And there's nobody mm. alive who was on the ship. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the FBI had some questions through diplomatic channels, but you're talking about a ship that's owned you know, that, that's run by uh, foreign nationals and, and how much they could be questioned. I don't know. That's a damn good question. Mm -hmm. um, David asked a question about the book, which I'm going to hold until after you talk about the book. Mm -hmm. um, what, and then somebody asked, why do you suppose the other inmates helping to supply the raincoats didn't arouse suspicion? And why didn't they demand to be included or threaten to rat them out? I, that, First of all, first of all, some of them just may have not wanted to take that particular risk. Uh, mm -hmm. They looked out at that harbor, at that bay. They also knew the stories about men who had died out there. But, you know, it, again, you're it, it's all conjecture as mm -hmm. to why. I mean, they would have had to build two rafts and then three rafts. And if nothing else, let's let help these four guys get off and really stick it to the guards and the uh, and the warden. Mm. to the authorities um cindy asks were were employees ferried over to the island daily could they have escaped by hiding on a boat a couple of them tried there was a very clever uh, uh prisoner who during the war world war ii alcatraz uh they did laundry for the army mm -hmm. so they bring the bunch of laundry, you know, like a kid coming home from college, they bring home all their laundry to Alcatraz. And then they, once it's clean, they ship it back. Well, one of the prisoners, he, he put on one of these uniforms. <laughs> I just, I love this. He puts on like a sergeant's uniform and he, and he somehow sneaks on the boat carrying the, he's got the, uh, the, the, the laundry. And then he tries to stay on the boat, but then they did a count. There were a lot more guards back then who maybe were a lot more aware and they went, oh, wait a minute, we're missing one. And they, they found him and they brought him back in. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a bunch more, a few, three, four questions, David. Is yeah. that okay? Sure. And then okay. we'll, uh, yeah, they, oh, sure. Okay. Um, I've seen somewhere that there were Native Americans reclaimed, that Native Americans reclaimed Alcatraz as their land, but the government yes. ended up kicking them out. Is that true? Yes, it is. That was in the 1970s. They oh. actually were occupied the island. This is I'd have to I'd have to Google it to be sure I'm accurate, but I it seemed to be like a year or so they were on that island. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, Deborah says was as Whitey Bulger was Whitey Bulger at Alcatraz the same time as these men. If so, did they know each other? Well, whether they knew each other is conjecture. Um, I did have some fun in my book with, with the fact that uh, Whitey was at Alcatraz on June 12th, 1962. And I give him a, a, a quote, which I, I, I have, I use a bad word, so I won't say it in public, but I do give him a quote when he finds out that Alan West has become a stool pigeon. So I had a little fun with that. Awesome, I love that. Um, Laura says, uh, this is sort of the last question before we move on. Sing Sing prison is not far away. Has anyone escaped from that prison, which is close to the ocean? I would have to look that up. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, again, somebody jumps over the wall or whatever from Sing Sing. They don't have to swim, you know, two to two miles in cold water to get to land. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, that takes care of those, that little- Great questions, thing. everybody, terrific, <laughs> thank you. And uh, if we have time when we're done, I, uh, I really appreciate everybody's uh, uh, questions. And uh, look, this book, uh, and I, it's, it was a long, long time in coming, but uh, this book was released by DX Varos Publishers, uh, on June 21st of, uh, of last year. 
everyone likes to ask, and it's a great question, where the idea for the novel come from? Well, as I've described, like millions of people, I had seen this terrific Clint Eastwood movie. And years later, like millions of others, I took the tour of the island prison, and that's me arriving at the prison as a tourist in 2011. It's a really pleasant ride from San Francisco, much nicer than the inmates uh, had. They were shackled to the hull of the launch, which would take them to the island. It's a, it's a fantastic tour. The National Park Service, I, I can't say enough good things. I'm sure many members of, of our audience have taken this tour. They give you uh, headsets. It's probably an MP, uh, probably a, a Wi-Fi thing now, but they give you headsets and a player and you guide yourself through the, the prison. And it's, it's really amazing. You hear the voices of inmates. You hear the testimony of guards. You hear perhaps uh, one of the most frightening sounds you'll ever hear, which is a set of steel doors clanging shut behind you. It's, it's really frightening, uh, but it's a terrific tour. And I remember standing here. This is in the same exercise yard where scenes in the Clint Eastwood movie were filmed. And I remember standing here looking across the bay. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge off in the distance. And we had just heard from one of the Park Service guides, and, and they're all terrific too, who told us a fascinating fact about the island. And it was at that moment that I not only conjured the idea for the novel, but I wrote its opening line. And here's the opening of the book. San Francisco was the cruelest trick ever played on the prisoners of Alcatraz Island. The city was only two miles away, so close that if the wind was just right, the cons could hear music and voices and the laughter of women emanating from that glittering jewel of a city. On those nights, John Anglin, prisoner number AZ1476, lay in his cot and covered his ears with a pillow. He couldn't bear the sound of all those happy, free voices. But tonight, as he stood at the water's edge of Alcatraz Island, he strained into the breeze to hear those sounds because he too would soon be free. The book, the novel, describes in some detail with some liberties, with describing making up some of the conversations they might have had, but it tells the story of the men building the raft in the prison, them escaping, and then the purely fictional part is what happens to those three men afterwards and how they get assisted in their bid for freedom uh, by a 13-year-old Sausalito boy who has his own reasons for wanting to help. The book is available from DX Varos, and you can find them at dxvaros.com. Or if you've got a phone, you can scan that QR code that will take you to the book's website. And um, folks, I, I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you again, uh, Mina, and thank you to the Ashland Library for having me today. If we have time, it's up to you. If we want to take any more questions or do any more Q&A. Happy to do so. Absolutely. We do have some questions. The one that Terrific. I uh, held off until now is from David. What inspired you to write the story from Tommy's and the boat's, boat family's perspective? How did you research that? Uh, I made it up. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> good. Uh, why? Uh, I needed a perspective that was a, a counterpoint to these three hardened criminals. And by the way, there's something very sweet, and, I, and, I, and I'm not romanticizing. John and Clarence, uh, they were thieves, um, and they did rob a bank, but I'd like to point out they used a toy gun. And when the authorities asked them, why did you use a toy gun to rob a bank? The response was, well, sir, we didn't want to hurt anyone. We just wanted the money. Um, Frank, however, that, that's just, you know, that's 
a lot of evil right there. And that's obviously he had a very sad and tough upbringing. Um, but I needed that counterpoint. And so you'll, if you've got the book and you read it, you'll see uh, the situation that Tommy was in uh, with his mother and living on a section of Sausalito called the houseboat section. By the way, all of that about Sausalito and its story all comes from just reading books about Sausalito and having interviews with people who grew up and lived in Sausalito at the time of the escape, and some of whom remember very well what it was like living there when the escape happened. Um, so Dory saw, not Dory says, uh, asked if we have the, your books in the library. And I know some libraries have them in Minuteman. I'm surprised mm -hmm. you can't find it, but we will definitely be getting uh, David's books here in, in Ashland. It's music um, to an author's ears. <laughs> I'm surprised we don't have them. Um, Stephen asks, what happens to them after in the book? Is it what you think happened or what you thought would be a good book ending? I, I like to, I don't, I leave that up to you. I leave that up to the reader. But the, the, see, I don't want to give anything away. Um, <laughs> that is okay. I think it's a satisfying, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly satisfied with the ending and uh, what happens to the three men. Okay. Well, and that should satisfy us too, right? Um, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, from the chat, I'm seeing people who have read your book have really. Oh, loved fantastic. It. Well, yeah. thank you all for everybody who's who's bought the book. Thank you. <laughs> and it's also yeah. available on Kindle. You know, it's like three, four bucks on Kindle now. So yep. Get the only disadvantage book. of that is I, I can't sign unless you want uh, me to mark up your Kindle. <laughs> uh, that would be kind of cool. Somebody says, how did you get access to a marshal? How willing were they to reveal info? Is it a cold case now? Uh, so here's how that happened. And it was it was just a bit of luck is I went to I grew up in, in a town in, in on Long Island. David, can I, of, um, can I stop you for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, since your QR code has been up for a while, do you mind turning off your screen share and then we can just talk? Oh, sure. I can do that. Thank you. How do I do that? Da, 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 da. Oh, yes. I click this thing that actually says, hold it. Stop share. There, there go. we go. Awesome. Um, I went to school, as it turns out, and this is what happens when you get on Facebook and LinkedIn and Insta, whatever. He he was a, he was a marshal. He was a U.S. marshal, and then he retired, and he actually ran for and became a representative for his now home, his now the state of Virginia. And I I contacted him. I said I said Bobby, I said I'm doing this book, and I'd love to talk with somebody. He goes oh. I know a guy who was assigned to it. And so next thing I know, I, I'm talking to a, a you know, a, a real U.S. Marshal who actually worked on this case. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was fun. Yeah, they're really cool. They're really interesting people. Mm -hmm. Did you answer the part about if it's a cold case now? Or it's not a cold. It, it, well, it is still an active case. In fact, it is also um, it, it's uh, internationally. Um, uh, um, Interpol has this as a red notice. This is an active case. And so there was a cousin or a nephew or a, uh, not Ken or David, but somebody from uh, the Anglin family was going to go to Brazil. And they were told in no uncertain terms by our government that if you go there, you will be uh, you will be arrested because you are getting yourself involved in a red notice case. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, Thank you, Patricia, for borrowing the book. I just saw that. Very nice. <laughs> yes. And Cindy <laughs> wants to know if there's a bookstore on the island that sells your book. If anyone knows anybody at the Alcatraz gift shop who I've tried to contact, I've said, hey, book, novel, <laughs> island. Uh, I tried. They don't seem to be. They, they, I, I don't know if it's there. Uh, I, I, I said, you know what? I will fly myself out there and give a talk on Alcatraz for nothing, mm -hmm. just to help you sell books. And they, they, they haven't replied. No. So David says he loved the book and I'm Ensign Gray. I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe you do. 
<laughs> uh, that is so the book hi david that's a former co-worker of mine <laughs> so <laughs> i one of the um one of the joys and one of the pleasures of being a writer uh is being able to take your dear friends names and put them into the book so my friend david gray i made him an ensign on one of the coast guard cutters uh, he fared better than an, another co-worker of ours named Joe Ducey, who I made a safe cracker and one of the inmates on the island. <laughs> so That is awesome. I love it. Um, Nancy says that she got the book from the Beverly Library. Nice. So it is in the li Minuteman system. Um, Katerina asks if your book is available in audio form. It is not. It's not. Okay. It is not. You should read it. That would be amazing. You know what? I've. Uh, it's funny. I'm the, right over there in my in my. St we have. My wife is a is a broadcaster, and we also has. A, we have a little home studio here. It's. It is. This is eighty thousand words, and it's. It's a lot. It's mm. a lot of work. Um, Amazon, the whole Kindle, uh, the, the audiobook system. They have very very specific uh requirements for how much for the how the audio has to be it's 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 a it's really a lot of work yeah i have heard that so although i think it would be awesome i get it yeah um and steven says if the case is still open then i suppose there is a larger network that they're trying to break i'm not really certain i mean it, it's the case is open but you know it's one of those uh, and i i'm just making a joke here, but I'm guessing it's one of those hazing activities they probably have at the U.S. Marshal or FBI office. Yeah. Give the new kid, give him the file just to show him what, you know, what it's like to have to deal with a with a tough case. So we have some very um, interesting folks here <gasps> because Nancy Alcatraz says, gift shop has my book <laughs> on their website. That's fantastic. Now I'm <laughs> going to have to go to their web. That's fantastic to know that. Thank you, Nancy. You oh, must be a researcher you, at heart. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so that's so great to know. Okay, so you'd think they would have replied to our email to tell me, Dave. <laughs> um, so Stephen follows up with his question about the criminal network. If it's just two guys that are going to die soon, why spend the resource? Of of I'm not sure I understand the question. Of looking for for the two guys that the, for looking the, for those two guys that were in the '70s picture. Right. So why would you set a precedent to say, yeah, if we don't catch you for 60 years, you're it's OK, you'll get away with it. Um, that, I think, is the would be the opinion of law enforcement and of the justice system. Mm. Uh, they do. They obviously they don't have a team of people working on this case, but it's a pretty bad precedent to say, yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll let, we'll let that go mm -hmm. since they, you know, <laughs> we're going to give you credit. Congratulations. You made it 60 years. So we're not going to go after you. They, they just can't do that. Okay. But again, you know, it's not like they have a dozen people working on it. Mm -hmm. So Charlene says that there's another book by Simone de Beauvoir, Beauvoir <laughs> also called Inseparable. So make sure you're looking for yes. the right one. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Um, and Joy says, was the water search right after the escape? Yes. Um, and one of another great advantage is uh, another coworker of mine. I didn't put her, I don't think I put her name in the book, but I, I actually worked with uh, um, a woman. I think she may have been, if not the, I think she was the first female Coast Guard captain. Uh, and she ran interdiction. Uh, with the Coast Guard off the coast of Florida for a number of years. And she was just a terrific source of details about operation of Coast Guard uh, search and rescue boats. And they had a lot of them. They had helicopters, they had Coast Guard. Uh, all the local jurisdictions were sent uh, uh, telexes, um, uh, for you kids, that's an old email uh, about the escape and descriptions of the men. Uh, the FBI came and they had agents all around the Bay Area looking for clues. So 
Yeah, air, sea, and land. They were looking for these guys big time mm -hmm. uh, for the first few months. So Nancy has continued on her rabbit hole and says that the <laughs> gift shop on Pier 39 in San Francisco, do they carry the book, Nancy? Or just list it on their website? She's answering. Um, so on that note, <laughs> we're just about out of time. And I wanted to say, Laura says in the um, Q&A, thank you, most enjoyable talk, which is oh, absolutely thank true. No, thank I, I, You've all been terrific. This is uh, always, a, you've always got a great audience that shows up for these. <laughs> and those were great questions. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who bought the book. Thank you. Absolutely. And for every, let, let us know in the chat or with reactions what you thought of this program. And I do want to say that Dave is going to be back with us twice later this year. And I will put that in the recap email, one about law and order and one about the big dig, I believe. Yes. Yes. So I'll put those, um, those dates and uh, registration links um, in the recap email I send you all. But thank you all for oh, being here you. and for all of your amazing questions. And for David, you're amazing. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.